Hi, uh, my name is Aaron Cohen. I'm speaking to you today from Toronto in Canada. Uh, I work for TD Bank Financial Group in AML Advisory uh, for Canadian Banking. Uh, I've been with the bank now for about 10 years, and um, I'm just going to speak to you today about underground banking and um, international terrorism. So I, as we know, the Iranian uh, financial system has been cut off from most of the rest of the world for the past decade uh, due to strict financial sanctions. Um, and that not only cuts off the financial system from Iran for the rest of the world, but it also cuts off individuals and entities that both operate in Iran and outside of Iran. In order for them to conduct proper transactions, uh, they must do so in the form of underground banking. While most of these transactions are for legitimate personal remittances, uh, there are transactions that are also used for Ill illegitimate purposes, such as terrorism and drug trafficking. So uh, I'm going to work through today what is meant by underground banking. Um, and then we will also cover how it relates to movement of funds globally through Hawaladars, uh, trade-based money launders, uh, virtual currencies, and, and the new, uh, uh, non, new non-fungible tokens. All right. So, right. Uh, in terms of underground banking, uh, we can generally define underground banking as banking activities that take place outside the formal financial system. They typically operate in parallel to the traditional banking system. And uh, they can range in scope from regional to national to international with different forms of predicate offenses uh, and stages of the money laundering process that potentially take place in different jurisdictions and most often concurrently. Uh, there are generally limited points of intersection between the two systems, which means that there's general, it's sometimes hard to distinguish the intersectionality between the banking system and when it crosses over with the underground banking system. And that presents a challenge, not only for financial institutions to keep track, but also very challenging for law enforcement uh, to identify and to fully understand these networks and individuals uh, involved who benefit from uh, underground banking. Uh, they create in material intelligence gaps with any given impacted sector that is in isolation. So uh, we'll talk about uh, what is meant by an informal value transfer system. So the most uh, common form of the, the informal value transfer system occurs in specific communities. And in Canada recently, it's mostly uh, in the Persian Iranian community, again, due to the limited means to move funds legitimately due to international sanctions. Funds may be received into a Canadian bank account via wires from gateway jurisdictions in the Middle East, uh, such as Dubai and Abu Dhabi and Kuwait, as well as uh, we've seen recently Hong Kong and South Korea, in addition to South America. Uh, further, Hawala type distribution is more difficult to trace as our exchange of funds is settle outside of the banking system. Some of this distribution is through licensed and unlicensed MSBs, with concentrations mostly in the northern Toronto area and West Vancouver regions and they're typically using cash couriers. Uh, there is frequently no indication of, of a connection to a specific country, the customer profile to link the trust, cash transactions to a specific informal value transfer network. So what I mean by that is it's, you know, we're trying to trace and, and, and uh, do some sort of transaction monitoring. Sometimes it's challenging to understand it because it may look like a domestic customer, even though it might be an international uh, customer. So, um, so that, that's how we see it through the MSBs, uh, through these, um, the informal value transfer. We also see it uh, through ROSCAs, the Rotating Savings and Credit Associations, and free loans. Um, different um, cultural cultures use the free loans. In, in the Muslim culture, it's known as CARD, and there's also in the Jewish culture, we have the free loan societies. And it's, these, these are mostly based on trust, similar to Hawala's, but it's, it's lending money from one area to another. Again, these can be used legitimately, but there are at times uh, where we have witnessed where these can be done illegitimately, where funds are saved and for tax evasion purposes, it's not done properly. And, and these are mostly conducted through check cashers, um, which again, somewhat disguises the, the system, uh, the, how, how funds are brought into the system. And we only see that inter cross section when the checks are cashed. So trying to go back is difficult to understand. And again, the Roscas are used uh, primarily in the South Asian, uh, West African and Filipino communities here in Canada. And again, these are also done on the trust basis system. So some of the red flags that we see when it comes to uh, the use of cash carriers is with individuals entering branches with large bags of cash and they make deposits into multiple accounts to unrelated parties. 
uh, difficult to trace who they're coming from if we're not documenting where the cash is coming from. We only see that it's coming to an individual and cash deposits will be done at branches nationally. So difficult to, 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 uh, to, to distinguish. We also see in terms of structured cash deposits. So transactions that just go below the $10,000 Canadian threshold. Um, you know, you'll see cash transactions totaling up to 10,000. Once it hits a $10,000 barrier, similar to the United States um, and, and other countries at, at similar amounts, uh, uh, documentation needs to be submitted to the federal government. Uh, and in order to negate that, people will structure their cash deposits uh, so they don't have to fill out that paperwork and, and identify the source of these cash transactions. Of course, banks do have the ability to monitor for these sorts of things, but again, it makes it challenging when it's, happen, uh, it's happening quite often. Um, in, in the slide over here, you'll see um, how some of these uh, forms of underground banking can be exploited. So in terms of the vehicle trade, and, and it combines with Daigu, which is the, the trade in products, uh, what we have seen, and, and it's going on for a number of years now, is um, vehicle sales. I mean, it's been known for the past 10, 15 years that terrorist organizations such as Hezbollah, that they mix proceeds of legitimate car sales in the United States and Canada uh, with illicit drug sales from uh, Central and South America. Um, and then those funds are used to purchase vehicles and send them out to West Africa, usually Benin, Ghana, or Nigeria. Um, we've seen this in Canada as well. Um, as you can see, the Lebanese Canadian Bank, which was unfortunately a large uh, uh, offender with this and didn't have proper monitoring to, to ensure funds weren't being used illegitimately. The Daigu trade is something a little bit more uh, different. Sorry about that. Um, when it comes to trade in South Asia. So it, it's mostly related to luxury items. I mean, recently we've seen a lot of the vehicle trade there as well. Um, funds coming in, we're not sure how legitimate the funds are coming in from Hong Kong or China and used to purchase luxury vehicles in Western Canada and then are shipped overseas. Um, unknown who the end users of these vehicles are, where they end up shipping, who they're for the benefit of, but we do see a lot of straw buyers purchasing these vehicles. It used to be somewhat mundane when a new iPhone would come out and we have a number of students have thousands of dollars of cash being placed into their bank accounts and then going into an Apple store and buying hundreds of phones. Um, and then we'd be seeing shipment payments from the bank accounts. This is escalated now into the used car and sorry, the new luxury car market. Um, and we've had some sort of um, dialogue with the BMWs and the Mercedes of the world to see how we can better um, tackle this. I mean, there are concerns that they want to have their vehicles shipped overseas, but our concerns obviously are with regards to money laundering as well. Um, we also see how it can be exploited through the use of digital gift cards. Um, in terms of the illegal drug trade, um, if individuals are uh, receiving cash for, for drugs, uh, cannabis is, is large in Canada, especially since the legalization in Canada. Um, the black market's still cheaper to, to purchase, so the black market is still large. Instead of putting cash back into the financial system, you can buy digital gift cards. Or if you're receiving email money transfers, instead of taking cash out, you can buy digital gift cards, and those can be transferred internationally. And again, underground, that banks will not be seeing it. We will see the in email money transfers coming in. We can determine based on domain addresses if it's in fact for cannabis related products. But again, there's that delay in timing. And at the same time, money can be depleted rapidly from these accounts in the form of the purchase of digital gift cards. So it, it all depends on the timing, but again, it can be done very quickly. In terms of underground casinos, and especially now during the, uh, the pandemic, uh, casinos are starting to open now in Canada, but for the past 18 months or so, casinos have been closed. There have been a few high profile cases in Canada where we've seen uh, in, in luxury mansions, uh, full on video terminals, uh, poker tables, uh, extreme casino activity, usually with handling millions of dollars in cash and again laundered uh, through the purchase of either virtual currencies, digital gift cards, or again, they can use that cash to buy to buy uh, luxury vehicles and then ship them back most often to China. 
Uh, the British Columbia government has recently gone through a full exercise in trying to understand the use of money laundering and casinos. And again, it's all tying back to, to, to China. Um, but in terms of the underground casinos, we see a lot of buy-in activity through the use of email money transfers. And it'll be joined into one house account and the money distributed uh, further from there. Um, and, and lastly, I mean, we haven't seen it yet in terms of, or no evidence yet in terms of exploitation of the non-fungible tokens. Um, th this is a new form of, you know, it, it's the, the purchase of buying virtual art or virtual moments. I, I think it was just last week, but the, the Israeli president uh, purchased or re received his father's uh, inauguration as president of Israel as a non-fungible token. Obviously, he won't be exploiting that, but there are ways to exploit that, similar to, to art. I mean, th there's no sort of uh, in, uh, value to art, and it and it's um, it, it can be um, interpreted how much art can be worth and how much these uh, non fungible tokens can be worth, and they can be exploited for value. So now, if you want to focus a bit more on the Iranian sanctions. Uh, Piece um, again. So since the the onset of the Iranian Revolution uh, about forty years ago, uh, but more recently in the past decade, there have been increasing financial sanctions that have been set up on Iran. Well, the main goal of the sanctions regime was to limit the country's ability uh, to produce nuclear weapons. The main thrust of the sanctions have been against the Iranian financial system. This has not only limited the way in which Iranian national companies are able to transact with the rest of the world. It has also severely limited the way in which Iranian nationals are able to transact financially, uh, globally, but also legitimately. This has been especially difficult from a Canadian perspective as the recent immigrants to Canada from Iran faced difficulties in moving funds to Canada once they emigrated from Iran. While banks conduct proper due diligence and screen all new clients and existing clients to ensure that they are not subject to sanctions or illicit as designated persons, there is increased scrutiny specifically placed on Iranian nationals. In order to qualify for certain products such as mortgages, banks asked increased questions as a source of funds from proceeds of real estate transactions from Iran. It is difficult for domestic banks to understand the source of funds as there are no active financial connections between the Canadian financial system and Iranian financial institutions. Iranians are forced to move funds through MSBs located mostly in the Gulf region as mentioned earlier. Um, also we've seen through in Turkey and Hong Kong. Um, and interestingly enough, in Canada and Toronto, due to the Iranian diaspora community being largely in the same location as the South Korean community in Toronto, wires from Seoul to MSBs locally are also seen to support the Iranian population. There is also uh, the issue of correspondent banks stopping or questioning funds directed to Iranian nationals. A challenge, and more recently due to the pandemic, is Iranian students who have come to Canada to study who have already paid tuition at colleges and universities, uh, but the universities and colleges have uh, had a challenge to refund these students, especially if the request is in uh, US dollars uh, as the Iranian students then come to Canada. So usually we'll see is a, a student expecting funds in US dollars, they request the funds to be sent to banks in Western Europe, usually uh, Germany or France, or perhaps Australia or Hong Kong. Uh, unfortunately, the correspondent banks that handle these transactions on behalf of the banks, of the larger banks, they question the ultimate beneficiaries and suspect that the funds are being ultimately directed to Iran. Um, it creates, unfortunately, a challenge for that. Even though there's, they have student visas and they're legitimately here in Canada or the United States, uh, they have a challenge just to get those funds back. Um, these are just a few examples of the challenges that uh, the local Iranian population faces and, and why they have to uh, enter into underground banking. Um, so locally, uh, in, especially in the greater Toronto area, we see MSBs opening up along certain corridors in North Toronto, West Vancouver, and certain pockets in Montreal where the Iranian population is based. These are usually storefronts that are inside grocery stores or jewelry shops, or even travel agencies and real estate offices but most commonly in currency exchange houses. Uh, While well, most are registered with FinTrack in Canada, which is the Financial Transactions and Reports Analysis Center, these entities don't remain in business for long periods of time and are often difficult to track. You can see in this picture here, this is an intersection just in, on Young Street, North Toronto. Some of these places will change their signs on a monthly basis, change phone numbers, and 
very difficult to track. This one plaza has about, this is just a small example, but uh, it has about six or seven and across the street, there's six or seven more. Um, there's about 40 in this one pocket of Toronto that operate this way. Uh, what will happen is um, the MSB will receive uh, large wires from Dubai or elsewhere in the region, as mentioned, and they will either issue checks or cash to third parties. Um, sorry, sorry, they'll issue, issue checks to third parties, email money transfers, or, or they will withdraw the proceeds as cash and then travel to banks in the region and make large cash deposits to multiple individuals. We become aware of these situations when a branch notifies us that, you know, uh, certain individuals come in with a large bag of cash and they don't know what to do with it. They do accept the cash that goes into multiple accounts and then it's up to us to figure out who it's going to, but also try to put in a stop to these exchange houses as well. So it does create a challenge. Um, so while most of these uh, store from MSBs assist the local population to move legitimate funds from Iran, there have been a few well-known cases locally known as Project Collector, Project Oryx, and others that have seen these MSBs move funds on behalf and uh, at, at, at the direction of the Iranian government and terrorist organizations such as Hezbollah. just one example and that was related to project oryx and had a connection to project collector where the rcmp investigated um, uh, drug proceeds being used uh, to traffic um, funds back to to iran um, the example used there was an individual who was operating a currency exchange house in pakistan uh, who had moved funds through dubai and ultimately to an msb based in uh, western toronto um, which was being exploited by the individual who was um, arrested, the individual who's going back and forth between Montreal. So in, in terms of next steps uh, for financial institutions, it all comes down to, to training and enhanced transaction monitoring. Uh, most larger financial institutions will have automatic uh, transaction monitoring um, that will try to look for scenarios based on these sorts of activities. It's all about tweaking these scenarios and understanding volume amounts, but also understanding the geography, right? So looking where wires are coming from, how funds legitimately should be looking when they come into the system versus how they can be used illegitimately. And it's also based on timing, um, trying to understand these transactions, but getting to them sooner rather than later, trying to act on these and, and stop these uh, illegitimate MSBs from operating much longer. But that also comes into training uh, staff when they come in to work for financial institutions um, due to the fact that um, anti-money laundering groups and in financial institutions, especially in North America, have grown exponentially over the past number of years. There is a delay in training uh, individuals to be properly educated 
to look for these uh, transactions and to understand the global uh, sanctions regimes, right? So they need to understand that and how they should be looking legitimately versus illegitimately. In terms of new guidances, the government of Canada has recently come out with uh, a mandate that all transactions related to Iran be reported to the federal government in terms of a suspicious transaction. Um, it's not necessarily if we are suspected of seeing funds from Iran, it's knowing if we know funds are coming from Iran or going to Iran, even though it's not going directly because that system is cut off, those uh, transactions need to be reported. It's easier for larger financial institutions to report these transactions. Uh, however, what it will do, uh, hopefully, is try to weed out these uh, money service businesses that keep popping up because they'll be under, they need to be registered with the federal government and they are regulated by the federal government. If they don't provide these uh, reports, uh, they will be fined, they will be shut down. So um, as, as long as there is further in, uh, interaction there, uh, some of these uh, problems should hopefully dissipate. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciated my time speaking with you today. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to reach out. My email address is below, and I'd be happy to uh, discuss this topic further. Thank you.